Welcome. This is Engaging Process, a podcast video series where art education and art making meet. I am art education professor Dr. Cam McComb. My pronouns are she, her. In this series, I talk one-on-one with professional artists to gain insight into the thinking, planning, experimentation, and research that becomes part of the artistic process. In this episode, I am delighted to be speaking with artist Maria Ruggiero. Maria, welcome to Engaging Process. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'm really delighted that you're here. Um, uh, Before we begin, I just am curious, what pronouns do you use? She and hers. Thank you. Um, And so, you know, I like to just ask artists right off the bat, like, why do you do this? Why do you make art? Yeah, I mean, I think it's kind of, there's like the longer story and there's like the shorter story, you know, things that are are more obvious and things that are less um, maybe intuitive. I think, um, you know, I've been making art since I was really little, my parents got me involved. Um, preschool, my mother did a lot of projects with me. And it wasn't something where I was thinking initially, oh, I'm going to be a professional artist later. It was, you know, something that engaged me and interests me. And um, I felt that it was um, rewarding on on various levels. And um, I probably decided to pursue it more intensively when I was older, you know, in high school and I was doing AP art and um, getting, you know, some success and and positive feedback. um, That's rewarding, but also just the process of making art was something that was rewarding to me. I think I wouldn't do it if it, if it wasn't that way. Um, That's your primary factor is it's just rewarding personally. It is. It's something I felt like I couldn't do without. I think um, I had a a lot of interest. I um, was a double major when I was an undergraduate in in studio art and English. And I also really loved art history Hmm. and I really liked uh, writing. Um, But when I thought about it, and this is probably where I really decided, you know, this is what I'm going to do. You know, what could I live without and what couldn't I live without? And I I felt like, yeah, making art was something I really couldn't leave behind to pursue, say, art history or or, um, English literature. So that's where I really took that direction more seriously, probably really as an undergraduate. You know, I'd been doing it for a long time, but that's where I really really came down to. You really have to invest in what you're doing, and and that's you know what I decided. So sort of in college, maybe as an undergrad, you started narrowing that focus. Yeah, I mean, I was a studio art major as well, um, but I was interested, as I said, in other things. But I really, yeah, you know, I decided I just couldn't stop making art, um, and that's what led me to where I am now. I think that's a good. Well, I enjoy hearing you talk about that because I see a lot of young people who are multi-talented such as yourself and uh, recognizing that at some point you do have to make choices if you want to really excel in particular areas. So uh, it's interesting to hear you talk about that. Um, So you already mentioned that your parents, one question I like to ask my guests is how did your parents feel about you becoming an artist? And so maybe you've already answered that, but how did they feel about it? That that is a good question because I know that sometimes people really um, do have difficulty with their family. It's, It's very understandable. I mean, it's not a guaranteed um, career, right? I mean, it could be very, very hard. I happen to come from a family um, uh, where my father is a professional musician, and uh, he's a professor at MSU, uh, music theory and composition, and also um, was a professional jazz musician. Oh, wow. And so I came from a place where, you know, my parents are obviously very open to, uh, you know, pursuing the arts if that was a thing that really engaged you and was important to you and was meaningful to you. Um, and so I had a, a lot of support. My dad is always also very interested in, in visual art. And when he had time, he would paint and draw and, and things like that. Um, so I was and, and I have a sister who's um, an opera singer and a, a professor of voice. So, I mean, that's sort of for me, it's my experience uh, growing up, that kind of yeah. acceptance and, and support, um, you know, so I feel very that's, lucky to have had that yeah. experience. Yeah, and that's great that your mom got you involved when you were young. I know my mom, we would do things that I think now we would just call crafts. Like there was a craft store and you could buy little kits and do things, you know, we'd yeah. go and pick one out each week and I would spend the week working on that thing. And so it just always taught me that I can make my own things and then... Um, 
I sort of deviated from that as I got older, but I think having a supportive parent in that regard is really helpful. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's great. And so when we talk about you as an artist, I mean, that's a big word, you know, and people ask, yeah, okay, you're an artist, but what do you do? Um, how do you self-identify? What words do you like to associate with yourself as an artist? I've always really thought of myself as a painter. Okay. Um, and um, I think that has sort of a broader range of, you know, meaning now. And, and when I was in school, I think things were a bit more um, discipline oriented. Um, and I feel like it's much broader. It's much more encompassing. And, you know, we think of ourselves maybe or more more of us do as 2D artists. Um, but I'm really I really love painting as my medium and so that's probably what I most closely identify as as a painter as a painter and so as a painter do you work in multiple I mean there's multiple paints right like right uh, I suppose we said it's multiple media and even though it's all paint but um do you have particular preferences of the type of paint you use yeah well obviously I use uh water-based um you know watercolor pigments um also permanent um kind of uh Staining watercolor like pigments, like um, inks and things like that, but mostly like high quality um, liquid and um, tube based um, watercolor pigments. But I also work in acrylic and I also have uh, a pretty significant background in oil. I love oil paint, but I decided some time ago that the fumes and various chemicals associated with working with oils, especially in closed spaces, was not something that I could um, continue to do. And so I moved to, and acrylics also got uh, much better from when I was like in, in I think, an undergraduate. It, they really are higher quality and you can add retarding pigments to them and other mediums to them. And so retarding pigments, they slow the dry time exactly. right, for people not aware so of So one yeah. of the things that I loved about oil paint was that you just could keep moving it around, you know, which is kind of funny because watercolor is very different from that. And so I, I've i always worked in these um, two types of uh, paints, if you want to think of it that way, two different types of paints, like side by side, and they really inform um each one informs the other. In the the acrylic of, and the watercolor. Yeah. It, I mean, acrylic also, you can use very much like watercolor. You can thin it down. You can yes. use it as glazing. And I work, um, when I, I um, paint with acrylic, I use it that way. And then I build it up. So I like that kind of thick, thin kind, kind of quality. Um, so I feel like, you know, and then when I'm working with watercolor, it has a very different um, kind of look to it. But I treat it sometimes in a very similar way that I would the acrylic um, in terms of layering my color and glazing and things like that. So they really are, you know, they look different, I think, initially, but for me, they're very related. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, and I, I think a lot of art teachers don't use oils for similar reasons, right? We're in a classroom with um, no ventilation, and yes. it's just not safe. And so even though, right, but oils get all the attention, people want to spend tons of money on oil paintings, but yet the the character and what you can do with watercolor and acrylics is also quite versatile, maybe maybe more so than oil paints in some regard. I mean, you can really do some dramatic things, I think, with with watercolor and acrylics. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, they all have their advantages and disadvantages, but I, I really felt like at a certain point that I could do enough that I loved about, you know, the oil paint, I could do it. I could do enough of that with my acrylics mm, and mm. the various things I was mixing into them where it wasn't so terrible to leave the oil behind. Yeah. So I, you know, and I really did love oil, but just the turpentine and, you know, all those things yeah. and then the danger of fire and fumes and it just wasn't worth it. Yeah. So. Yeah. I appreciate that. Yeah, and I want to talk about, um, we have five of your paintings that we're going to discuss today, so I'm interested to start talking about that. But I also want to draw the, you know, perhaps listeners recognize that watercolor is like the first paint most children come into contact with. And, um, of course, I, the problem with watercolor, though, is that people hand them a set of pan, right? Pans are like semi-moist, you just add water and they work. Um, so people hand um, a child a, a set of wa these watercolors and typing paper and they go, hey, go paint. <laughs> and maybe some students enjoy that. Some children love that. But then the problem is, of course, trying to paint on copy paper is not what is really meant for, right? So 
like talk about the surface. Like we're going to talk about your painting, but let's talk about the paper. Like yeah. what, what's important about what, what would a listener or a viewer need to know about the paper that you're actually painting on when you work in watercolor? Yeah, so really lightweight drawing paper or printer paper will give um, you very disastrous results. It would be very frustrating for the person painting because um, it's not sized properly, right? And so actual... What water- does that mean? For people who are not familiar with terms in art, like what does what is sizing? What do you mean? So sizing, you can think of it almost like, you know, when you get um, uh, maybe a, a, a new shirt that is, is feels starchy or has something in it, has some kind of sizing in it. Um, uh, and, and maybe if you think of uh, kind of similar to the way you would prepare a canvas for oil or acrylic, you prepare that that surface so that the oil or the acrylic doesn't just bleed all over the place and, and you know, it's contained and the, the surface of the fabric is yeah. protected. So good watercolor papers have a kind of sizing, um, you know, substance in them that it, so that when you paint on the, the paper, it doesn't bleed like you were painting on fabric or something like that. So... Um, because very good uh, watercolor paper uh, is cotton rag. It is kind of like a fabric. And if it didn't have sizing, you wouldn't have um, much control over, you know, um, the surface. Like you would, you would, uh, you you know, put something down, it would just bleed. You'd have fuzzy edges, which could be kind of nice, but probably you, you wouldn't, you know, you wouldn't have a lot of control or options in terms yeah. of how it would work. And you also want the pigment to kind of stay closer to the surface for watercolors. So, it, um, you know, different papers will, will absorb differently. And um, I like papers where the pigments are, you know, they maintain their brilliance and sit closer to the surface rather than sinking in and becoming a little less vibrant. Like a sponge that sort of disappears down into right. the surface of that paper. Exactly. Or into the substance of the paper, I should say. And what's your favorite paper to use? I really love Arches, bright white watercolor mm, paper. Mm, mm. And I personally use um, a 300-pound a um, paper, which is a very heavy paper. It feels like uh, almost like cardboard. Yeah. Um, and I like it because I don't like to stretch my paper. I like to use the whole sheet. Um, so stretching paper involves, you know, soaking a lighter weight watercolor paper, oh. usually like a 140 pound, which is what I use with my students. And it's really great paper, sure. but it will wrinkle more as you're painting on it. There are things that you can do to kind of cut that down, like so painting the back with and then sticking it to like a waterproof surface and then painting on it while it's damp so that it's basically damp on both sides. So the wrinkling has to do with it being wet on one side and not on the other. Um, but you can soak that paper and attach it to a board um, yeah. and that will keep it flat while you're working for the most part. And that's nice. really nice. I don't like to do that myself because I like to have the natural edges of the paper visible when the piece is done. Right, yeah, I know. I took a water. I took two watercolor classes back at the Columbus College of Art and Design when I was living in the Columbus area, Ohio, and um, yeah. So we would stretch our paper. I think we even stretched three hundred pound paper. Oh, you can, of course. But yeah. I didn't like the fact that you lost the deckled edge, right? right. That raggedy edge. Yeah, it's um, a beautiful edge. It is, and it has yeah. such character. And it, sometimes people will frame it and leave the edge right in the image when they frame it, and um, otherwise it gets cut away because you're putting that thick gummy tape on it that keeps it attached to the board so yeah tape and actually for my students I have them staple because then they can paint to the edge and if they don't mind the um staple holes which sometimes are not that um intrusive in the image sometimes they are sometimes they're not then they do have the option of floating the piece which is what you were talking about you know showing the whole uh, paper basically in the edges when it's being presented nice nice so um, let's let's really get into your work. So I appreciate the time talking about materials. I think that's important. Um, so we have a painting here, and uh, if you're in, st- uh, if you're watching this on video, you can see it. And if it's a podcast, um, if you do want to see the images we're talking about, you can go to my website. Uh, it's drcamcreates.com and um, see the images in the video. So um, what we're looking at an image on the screen now. And first of all, what's the title of this work? Act soon. Act soon. Okay. Yeah. I, I'm curious to know more about that. But basically, for those of you listening, I am looking at this like extremely brilliant collection of color, right? And the to- the dominant colors in the palette are like pinks and blues. And then there's some touches of, I see violet coming. I see yellows and greens. And um, we're looking at a, a floral 
but there's other things happening in this painting. So could you elaborate? Like, what what did I miss in that brief description? So um, to be super specific, it is based on a still life arrangement, although, as you say, there are other things going on um, in the piece. And the still life consists of an arrangement of flowers that are um, that I got in Hawaii. So I made uh, this when I was in Hawaii for the most part. Um, and so I I don't know the name of the plant that I have in there, but <laughs> yeah. it is a beautiful, um, you know, tropical flower. And there are, I think there is a bird of um, paradise in there and some others. And then there's also some fruit that had been um, purchased at a fruit stand, at a vegetable stand. Um, so th- all of these um, sort of uh, still life elements and um, botanical forms, they come from the place that I was in. Um, some of the background is actually fabric, um, hmm. a shirt, a Hawaiian shirt that belongs to my son. And so that is what the blue background is. So you can kind of see the connection to place there. Um, and there's also a little ornament in the top, which is reflecting the space beyond the um, the immediate still life. So, um, so it is, I consider myself based in the still life genre, but I definitely manipulate that, um, sometimes to greater or lesser degree in, in, in my work. Uh, the title has to do with, um, so a lot of my work, I'm, I'm very interested in sort of the state of the environment. And, um, I think, I feel like we're kind of in a crisis place with, um, with global warming and, and, and things that that entails. And, and that is kind of a very large subject. So I, I try to focus on things that are very relatable to my own experience. And um, my uh, still life arrangements have to do with, again, sort of my immediate surroundings and my connections to that, that larger topic, but in this sort of microcosm or smaller space that is, is immediately kind of um, I guess, uh, applicable to me in my own experiences. Sure, sure. And so this notion of act soon is like, you know, we've had all these climate conferences and the message is very clear that we're really coming to a critical tipping point. And if we don't act quickly, we're going to lose a lot. Um, many, many things that are important to us. Um, and so uh the the sort of the underlying idea is like if you act soon there's like a little blue marble which is my reference kind of to the earth that's a part of the still life we see that in other paintings that you've made so that's interesting that okay so that's your representation of the globe of our... in this particular piece yeah it's yeah. sort of like you can you can win this you can win all this if you just act soon act quickly well, it's interesting because we think about work that is environmentally minded, let's say, and often we think of protests people have, or we we talk about, even if we go back to Robert Rauschenberg's uh, first poster of Earth Day, it sort of showed a juxtaposition of animals, but then it also had destruction. And so, you know, seeing that, and um, I don't see the destruction aspect here, right? You're, you're kind of looking at this from a, um, here's what we will preserve. Right. Very much so. Yeah. You know, so that, and I'm... I'm very I feel like, you know, if we if we value something, if we if we find it appealing in some way. And I I, so I try to create my work to to embrace those those notions to say this is what we're trying to hold on to. Right. This is what we're trying to preserve um, rather than this is here's the immediate threat and here's what's going to happen if, um, you know, we don't we don't change our ways. Yeah. It's more like this is what we want to save. Um, Nice. Yeah, so I want to kind of get into the specifics of, you know, so this painting, Act Soon, I mean, there's a lot going on here. And um, I think you have a second painting we'll look at, but I sort of want to deconstruct. So somebody who's not a painter might look at this and think, oh, I could never do that. And yet, well, if they understood how it's broken into pieces and parts, right, mm-hmm. you don't just one day like walk in and like paint that all in one session, oh, right? Uh, no, I do not. <laughs> how, how many days, like how many, you know, how many... I don't know. Do, do you work for hours at a time? Do you work in little spurts? I, know. I wish I could. Yeah. I mean, for me to get things done, I really need hours at a time because my process is very, very slow. And I that's one thing that I'm really struggling with. I mean, when, with a lot of other demands on my time, um, you know, I developed this work when I had more time and I was able to really spend 
you were in Hawaii. Yeah, you had well, off ride and you were on vacation. I <laughs> mean, earlier in my life, you know what? I ah. could spend like five, six, seven hours really at a stretch working. I yeah. And I cannot do that anymore. So, um, yeah, if I have just a little bit of time, I'm sometimes held back by the notion of like, I really I can't get anything mean, meaningful done in this. Right. I mean, there's sometimes where I do have a very specific task. So, for instance, I often start with these paintings. I start with a drawing, a pretty detailed drawing. So that's something I can do and work on. Um, and I don't always draw everything out before I start painting, but I draw, you know, in some of these more complicated pieces, a lot of it is drawn out. Yeah. Um, so that's usually the first stage after I've done my planning and, um, you know, working out imagery and composition, um, usual, usually through um, in, uh, you know, photo references and things like that um, and combining them in different ways. I don't always do it the same way, but I do a lot of drawing initially. So that's something I could say, well, I have a couple hours I can work on this. Yeah. And, um, you know, so the drawing part may take me, you know, a couple days. Um, and it's really hard to say how long a painting like this would take me because I can't work on it in a cohesive way. And if I could, I would get it done sooner. Sometimes my paintings take months for me to finish sure. the larger pieces really do. And that's just the reality of how I can work. Well, and I think this notion, um, I get what, you know, a lot of artists will sit down and I call it like binge working, uh, right? We'll sit and binge television, we'll binge um, all kinds of aspects in our lives these days, but art making can happen that way. Um, sometimes you get entranced by the process and you just even can't pull yourself out just because you just want to keep working and working and working. But then is that healthy? You know, sometimes like if we think about binging and you know, you can have problems with your posture, you can next thing you know, your hand is aching and you have to do exercises. So I think this notion of being able to go into a work and say, all right, I'm going to work on this for an hour or a half an hour and have a process that allows you to go in and out. Um, I think for young people these days would be really great to, you know, say, how can I approach this and not have to take forever because you're right I do put off sometimes you know oh, I can't complete this in the two in the 20 minutes I have so I won't work on it at all and yeah. yet 20 minutes of focused work you can get a lot done in a brief period of time yeah and, and also you know when it comes to kind of painting the piece yeah. um, I do divide it up you know and and yeah maybe it's one leaf maybe it's one small very small section but then you can develop that section um, you know, and I work in different ways. And when I'm starting a painting, I work uh, more holistically, I work over the whole piece. Um, like the one that's on the screen now, it started that way. Yeah. So what are we looking at now? What's the title of this work? This one is Nikos Fish. Mm -hmm. And Nikos is my son. Um, so uh, I mentioned that, you know, I bring in sort of aspects of my life. And of course, being a mother, that's a huge aspect of my life. And and when he was younger, we, you know, we traveled, we'd go to places like um, this actually kind of references the Monterey Aquarium in California. That's a big conservation institution. I mean, they really do a lot. It's a fascinating and beautiful place. Um and the um, fish uh, toys that you see in the in in the vase there were you know I purchased for him, and so I often bring in aspects of his experience as well um, as my own into these works. And um, I think this is the piece where I I showed more of the process of developing the imagery, um, but the um, sort of one of the underlying ideas here is that you know. Um, I'm, I'm trying not to see things in kind of a black and white way in terms of my content. And so, you know, I, I, I love the Monterey Aquarium, but I also, they also have all these gift shops. They have all these plastic toys. And, of course, plastic in the oceans is like a huge issue. It's a huge problem. Right. But I also I, I fully admit that I'm part of that issue. And I bought these toys for my son and I still have them. And I'm glad they haven't like ended up in the ocean somewhere. But the, it is a sort of contradiction like to help this institution, I'm also adding to the problem in some way. So I feel like there's we have a lot of conflicting experiences. You know, yeah. even it's 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 very easy to say I'm for this or against this, but the reality is much more complicated. Um, so that's part of what that imagery, yeah, relates. Well, to. and I'm conscious of those listening. Right? So when we talk about Nico's fish, but basically we're looking at we're looking at this very atmospheric. Um, I don't know, there's all these really interesting shapes just floating around the paper and then emerging from this watery 
ooze almost. It's very pretty. Is it is this flower vase that is sort of discernible, and then you see flowers out the top, and then you see these images of um, fish sort of coming out of this glass structure, and then we see these spheres that you referred to in your previous painting um, floating in space as well, and. Um, and I just find it interesting that it's so watery and then you've got these, you know, it's almost like it's trying to be a painting, trying to be something as opposed to the previous uh, painting we saw that it's, it's popping off the page, right? I mean, it's really bright. You can tell they're flowers. You can tell exactly what you're looking at. We're here. You have to really try to figure out what you're looking at, which I, I assume that's intentional. Right. And actually, this comes from a sort of a series. And I, I should correct myself. So the vase there is is related to another piece called Nico's Fish. And um, the painting that we were just looking at is Bloom. And the the thing you were pointing out before uh, the sort of what those blobs in the background yeah. are actually based on images of jellyfish. So um, I did a series of pieces that kind of related to this notion, again, bringing in my interest in the still life genre. So you have the vase and you have this sort of controlled setup, but then the background imagery comes from photographs that I took from um, exhibits and various aquariums. And one of them was of jellyfish. Um, so a bloom, of course, could be a flower, and you see a vase of flowers there and something very positive and beautiful. Um, and, and also, it can be a bloom where you have way too many jellyfish in the water because the temperature is too warm. Mm. And that's what's in the background. That's the of, term they use for it. It's the term they use for mm. it. And it's also interesting because we use that term in watercolor in, in a process in which you create something called a bloom. And that's where you let your... Um, you let uh, like a, a wash or a layer of um, pigment and water kind of sink into your paper a little bit. Yeah. And then put a really wet brush on top of that, like either with just water or another color. And because the other pigment hasn't set in your paper, it creates something called a bloom, which sometimes people find frustrating. Well, sometimes I've always heard of it as being referred to as a mistake. <laughs> but you can Some intentionally do way, it, right? right? You can intentionally do that. Sometimes yeah. it's hard to get it to happen. Some people call it backwash, where your the water on your brush is more than what's on the surface. So if there's an imbalance there, then it will push the pigment away a little bit, but also cre create kind of an edge, which can be very beautiful. And I teach my students to do that so they know how it works and yeah. how to avoid it if they don't want it to happen. Um, but it's a really, I think it's a really beautiful um, quality in, in some watercolor. It's really embracing the process, like what the pigment and the water does on the surface. Um, so I love that the these multiple meanings of the word bloom, you know, and they're well, all kind of incorporated in that particular piece. Well, I was thinking this is back to your interest in English, right? You're coming back to the language and saying, okay, wait a minute. Uh, it is a word, but it's also these three separate things, and I'm going to encapsulate them all into one work. Yeah, which is interesting. So you, you I, I had on the screen for a moment, like so you you're working from real objects, you're taking photographs. So you know, if you want to capture a uh, a leaf, for example, you're not going to stand there and just look at the leaf out in your garden or wherever it is. It's helpful to have a picture to right. kind of photo reference. Yeah, and then so now I have a slide on the screen for listeners that. Uh, I have the painting that we've been talking about to the right, but to the left is a shot of a Photoshop. So tell us about why are you using Photoshop and how are you using it as a tool to help you in your painting? Right. So I don't always use Photoshop, but um, uh, for some of my work, I find it useful when I'm in, um, incorporating sort of environmental elements with some of my still life arrangements. And that's what's happening in this example here and I am really not a great I'm not really great at using Photoshop like I'm technically not that <laughs> proficient it, I use it as a tool a planning tool yeah to kind of preview um, what I'm doing compositionally and work out my ideas and combine various elements together and so yeah the other photographs that you were looking at were these various elements kind of separate and then this was the the idea as a whole um, but then the painting itself doesn't look exactly like that, right? So I don't use Photoshop to then copy it exactly in my right, painting. Right. It's more a way to set up a certain um, amount of the composition, but then I will deviate that from that as well as I proceed with my, sure. my painting. No, I love when, um, when I can have artists talk about the tools they use because – 
right? There's that fallacy, I think, in um, teaching art to young people that everything has to either be observed from real life or it has to be preexistent in your mind, and that's your source for art making. And actually, it's far more uh, complex than that, but also simple, right? Like you can take a bunch of images, real, maybe from your imagination, put them together, use the computer or digital technology as a tool to sort of help you imagine that all in one space. And so that to me is equally a reference as just sitting there with the real still life in front of you, except you've messed around with it digitally and said, okay, I'm going to now use this as my inspiration and I'm going to have a conversation. I mentioned in a previous podcast, like there's an art educator, Manny Bark, and he was a painter and he just talked about painting as a conversation. And so, right, you might have the idea of what you want to do, but then the paint is also going to react and have its own voice. So do you find that when you paint that you're often like having this? Absolutely. Hopefully it's a pleasant conversation yeah. with the paint. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think engaging with the material in the process and not um, being kind of single minded in this is what it's going to look like when I'm done. I don't know what it's going to look like when I'm done. You know, I mean, I have an idea of what I want and but I will respond to what's happening in my process. And I, I'm I feel like, you know, there's that balance and, and some of my pieces are much more planned and much more controlled and others are much more open. And this particular example is one that's more open and is responsive to the process of making the piece yeah. and things that happen in, in that process and responding to that, as well as my underlying idea and, you know, imagery that I'm using. So I'm combining, I'm kind of moving back and forth between those two aspects nice. of making. Nice. Yeah. I painted for, I don't maybe 10 years, uh, mostly watercolor, some acrylics, but I enjoyed painting. And then I would walk away from the piece, you know, maybe a day or two and then come back. And I always saw it differently, you know, and it was like, okay, now it's speaking to me and let me have a reaction back to the work. So yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. And sometimes you have like, in, at least for me, I will sometimes have something in mind that I'm very fixated on. And then as you say, you stop you move away, and if you can't come back, you can't really remember what it was that thing that you were going to do. Then probably you didn't need to do <laughs> that <laughs> right. thing, right? So that's important too to not get you know so engaged in the end goal that you don't see what's happening along the way. Well, and it's just good listening, right? Like if you're trying to listen to another person, if all you sit around and think about is what you want to say, and you're not listening, I think you don't have as uh, rich of a conversation. So if we can think about our art materials that way and really react and listen to what the material is saying to us, I think that we can be, I don't know, more dynamic and responsive in how we make art. Right, right, absolutely. Yeah, there's a responsiveness, I think, that is really critical to art making for me. Yeah. Nice. Let's look at where you do this work, right? So I've got mm -hmm. an image on the screen. Actually, you uh, when I ask uh, you to provide images of your studio space, you have two spaces, I see. So. Two small spaces, yes. Yeah. And one of them, is this one here, where I tend to do more of my flat work and, and the watercolor has more natural light. Yeah, so what she has is a desk. We're looking at a desk that's facing the window and outside the window I see trees and some green space and then uh, there's a chair and then to the right. So there's a watercolor painting on a flat table and then beside that there's a giant enameled or there's like enameled cookie sheets. Or it's a like a butcher. It's called a butcher plate or something like that. Um, that's a type of uh, 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 palette that I particularly like and some people really hate <laughs> because there's no segmented way to keep your pigments um, apart. But I really like it. Yeah. And so we see this colorful plate just full of all the colors that we also see in the painting. And so do you clean that between paintings? No, never. That's never got many years of paint on it and it yeah. dries enough so that if you want to I don't know I, I see people just wash their palettes out and throw away all that paint right yeah like, I that makes me crazy I, I I understand you do need like clean spaces right yeah for um, uh, brighter pigments which I, I use a lot of and you don't want to be accidentally mixing your yellow with the blue if that's not your intention um, so I do clean off portions of the middle yeah sometimes where it's really thin but you can reactivate all of that paint and that's a nice thing with watercolor you can't do that um yeah. really with acrylic uh so um yeah some of those paints are pretty old <laughs> on there um but i you know i'll come up with things or mixes that end up in multiple paintings then because of that that surface do you have favorite brushes 
I do, and I kind of vacillate between them. I um, I'm trying to remember. I have like a a silver gold or gold series. I was, I can't remember like the the names, but I had some that were natural uh, bristle from, I think Utrecht made them, yeah. um, like a Klinsky sable. Those are those can be very nice if they hold. I, I like brushes that hold their shape and also hold a certain amount of water. That's really the key, I think, with watercolor painting. Yeah. People are often afraid of the larger brushes, but what I, I always tell my students is I'm like, that's, you know, that's a really, that's your friend. The larger brush is your friend because it's holding more water. You're not constantly going back and forth between yeah. your palette and um, your water container and, you know, adding and adding and adding to the surface with different kind of amounts of water or pigment. If you've got a brush that holds more, you can do more and yeah. you have more control over what's happening on the surface. So, And a good brush will hold the water. Exactly. It's not going to, you're not going to pick it up and have it drip all over the place. Right. It will hold the water. Um, you know, and you're thinking about like the scale or the surface area that you're trying to cover. So I have large flat wash brushes. I have large round wash brushes. Those are usually things that I use earlier in my process. And I'm, you know, putting down the underlying um, uh, washes or, you know, these would be like very watery pigments, lighter colors that I am using, um, either as background elements or negative space or as the basis, you know, underlying color for other things that are going to go on top. And then as I, as I kind of move forward, I will use a high quality size 10 round, size 8 round. Those are really good brushes for yeah. doing a lot. Um, yeah, I, I tell people, like, you really have to invest in the brush, right? You, you have to pay 10 or $20 for a brush that you want to use that's going to really be effective. Don't use – so if you're using pan watercolors, right, from – the store, you don't want to use the free brush that comes with it because those are <laughs> horrible. I used to take the free brush and then I would use them for ceramics because they're wonderful for putting glaze on pottery. Oh, good. And when the little bristles come out, they burn off in the kiln, right? Uh -huh, it's no yeah. big deal. But you don't want the bristles falling out into your watercolor painting and, and it they're they're horrible. That you can't get a fine point out of those free right, brushes. Right, like right. I don't know why they include them, but um yeah. yeah, there's actually a very reasonably priced series, the Simply Simmons series that I have a lot of students get. And they're they're really decent brushes and very inexpensive as brushes go, like three or four dollars. Um, Simply Simmons? They're called Simply Simmons, yeah. Hmm. So it's a whole series of brushes that are made for watercolor. They're synthetic, but they're fine. They work really well. Um, nice. Yeah, so you don't – and I have I have a brush that probably cost me $85 10 years ago, it, you know, and that's just a size – I think 10 of hour and eight even um, because of the quality of the, the, you know, natural hairs in the brush and just the way it's been made. No, you don't really need that to make a good piece. You can yeah. get something that's much more reasonably. But surely you feel pretty nice. special when you paint with that brush. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's a nice brush and I try to take care of it. Um, but I, I, you know, yeah, it's not, it's not absolutely necessary. Yeah. So I'm looking at your other studio space. This You said it's a small room. This is where you do your acrylic work? Yeah, most of my acrylic work, right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes I do um, watercolor down there, but you can see the lighting is, is really different. Mm -hmm. um, it's in kind of a basement-like space, and I do have pretty good lighting, and I've got different types of light, like a mix of daylight lights and lights where I can change the temperature of the lighting. But it's Why, why does different. that matter? Um, so some of the lights that we use kind of have a bluish tint to them. Yeah. Some of them have a warmer tint, and that affects the way, you know, you're seeing your color. And color is really critical, yeah. you know, for me to understand what I'm doing with that color. Um, and so having a mix of those uh, temperatures and also um, LED lights that I can change that that kind of the color or tone on uh, can be helpful. And you can kind of switch yeah. through and or find a mix that works well. So if people are working um, in a classroom where it's just fluorescent lights, they're going to really have a different reaction, right? I think you're going to see your color differently. And yeah. so that's why I like to have my watercolor um, where I have natural work, a uh, natural light, sorry. And I can see just I can have a better sense of what the color really is because, um, yeah, there's this kind of, I don't know, greenish or a strange tone that you get if it's just fluorescent lights. Let's look. So you've given me another um, work, and I think um, 
it might even be combined with some of the photo references we were talking about in your other work. But um, so is this is this one the one you were referring to as Nico's? That's Nico's fish. And so that yeah. was sort of um, when I put together that sort of brief slideshow of images, which shows this piece, Nico's fish and bloom. Yes, it was. This piece was sort of where I started, and it's very much related to Bloom. And I was showing, and I actually put this together for my students so I could show them. Yeah. You know, I was working on sort of this bigger idea that went over multiple pieces. And how did I how did I come up with this idea and how did I create imagery for it? And this is kind of the starting point, um, which has very similar, a sort of similar kind of process behind it, combining kind of still life elements yeah. with images that I took from um uh, mostly aquarium spaces. Yeah, so this image is similar to the one we saw before, except the, we don't see the flowers popping out the top. And, and, and in fact, though, we see these, uh, what are those sea urchins? What's that type of, uh, but but you're making them kind of look like flowers at the same time. So there yeah, is that they sort of are. reference. They, I think they're in, is it anemones? I yeah, can never say that word. That's yeah, it. it's, yeah, so they are anemone. these, they are very floral like but they're also related to jellyfish and so that makes a lot of sense because then bloom it does actually have the jellyfish in it yeah yeah and so these are photos this little um three different images we're looking at on the screen now we have just sort of so this is from the aquarium the image on the left and then we have the jellyfish i suppose that's also from the aquarium yep, yep. and then the image on the right so you took all these images you're not right. just um harvesting these off of the internet somewhere. no these are all my own images and Again, you know, I'm not a photographer. I'm using these as references for myself. And sure. so I'm not cr using them to create, you know, works that are basically just copying those images. They're, I'm really. So anytime I talk about using a photo reference or using Photoshop, I feel you jumping in kind of really wanting to clarify that you're not copying that. Like, why does that why does that matter to you? Why clarify that? Well, I mean, for one sense, in one sense, photography is its own art form. I'm not a photographer, yes, right? I'm yes. using it as a tool. It's part of my um, way of developing imagery and ideas. And sometimes the photographs lead to ideas. Sometimes they lead to compositions. But then I'm taking them apart and using them in a very specific way. Whereas I think sometimes, especially students... Um, maybe coming out of high school, they like snap a photograph and then they paint that photograph and that's where they kind of begin and end. Yes. You know, and, and that might be okay. Like it could be a really strong photograph. It could, and I'm not saying that's necessarily wrong. I'm just saying that's not how I really work, you know, so I'm. So what's to be gained when you don't just copy the photo? Like when you, right. So I, I get that. I just, and I, I agree with you. I just would love for listeners to hear like what, what else it, if you're using the photo as a point of reference as opposed to copying it, what is to be gained by going beyond the photo? Well, you're not tied to it. And as I mentioned before, I'm not a photographer, so I'm making all kinds of mistakes. Like I'm not thinking about these as their own, you know, finished compositions. I'm taking the picture because I like something about the color. I like the forms that I see. Um, yeah. But maybe all together in my photograph, they're really it's not really that interesting but yeah. combining it with other things so I just have more control over the imagery for myself yes um and also if I'm not tied to one particular photograph I can I'm free to make other decisions as I paint you know we talked about the responsiveness before yeah. so rather than feeling like I need to copy every little thing that I see in this photograph I'm really like well I'm going to use this from this photograph and then I'm going to do something else over here or I'm going to draw from another source I'm just going to paint in response to what I have here. So that's just my process. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Which is what we're here to talk about. Yeah. And so, yeah, even in the jellyfish, you could even not even make the whole jellyfish. You could just use it as like, oh, I want to focus on the contour, but do something completely different with the interior space of that jellyfish. Right. You know, and that's exactly. where the inventiveness, I think, comes from using the tool and uh, being able to invent within your own practice. Right, right. So I'm really using these photographs as as tools, you yeah. know, as yeah. a starting point in some ways. Yeah. And so I kept, when you gave me the reference images, I kept thinking, well, what's with the fish? What's with the killer whale? And, yeah. And so, yeah, so they're um, toys and, you know, that you have for your son, but your this notion of your interest in the environmental impact, like what – Reference, like, why the killer whale in particular? Well, I, I just think that that's a funny image that I I provided. You see, like, a very messy um, kitchen table, basically, with this one little vase. And th the reason I have it 
that way is because I wanted that particular view of the whale. I yeah. wanted it to be coming out of the vase. So like he's breaching, like yeah, but I also the- like he would arrange flowers right in a vase. Yeah, right? yeah. And this kind of containment. So um, I used the whale because it was one of my son's toys that I'd purchased at at, at the aquarium. At the aquarium, mm-hmm. right? And um, I was going to incorporate that as its own thing. So you can see, obviously, that table's a mess. I'm not using that. Um, whole photo reference. I'm just using a part of it, the part that I need, right, yeah, yeah, to incorporate yeah. into my um, my arrangement. And um, you know, whales are impacted, of course, like everything else in the ocean, by our actions and um, you know the, the the state we're leaving the oceans in through contamination, plastic, you know, warming waters and so it but it's also again this toy that I purchased for my son so I'm like saying yeah I'm I'm culpable here and um you know the vase is also you know I have this I love the Monterey Aquarium because the the the, um, spaces are huge and they're you know they're encompassing it's like you're walking into this other world but they are still containers right they're containers that are not natural they look very natural they're very beautiful and I love controlled, arranged things on one level. I make still life paintings. Um, yeah. But I also acknowledge that, you know, we are containing things that really aren't meant to be contained. And that's um, partly the, you know, the use of the vase, the clear vase mm. in both of those mm-hmm. paintings that we've been looking at. Mm. Interesting. So look at this work. Um, so back, right, you have this comment. First of all, what's this painting called? This is called Pairings and Divisions. Pairings and divisions. Okay. And so for those of you listening, what we're look it's interesting because um, I don't know how to describe this work because I see lots of um, sea creatures uh, kind of in the background of the painting. I see this, um, maybe, uh, is it a blooming effect in these watery uh, imagery in the background? And then there's these floral uh, images in the foreground, but I'm not looking at it like a traditional still life where you would see it from the side. I'm looking at this, I believe, from an, like an aerial view mm-hmm. of the work. And so um, it it really has this sense of depth to it as if I'm like traveling, you know, from the earth into the ocean. If I could say as I travel through and looking at the painting, um, h- how would you describe what we're seeing? So unlike some of the earlier pieces we looked at, this is a more straightforward still life painting yes. in that it was set up and very intentionally, you know, um, I'm looking down on it, um, but it hasn't been manipulated in terms of adding other imagery in. The fish uh, that you see are all toys, yes. you know, again, yes. this sort of bag of fish toys, including the the one that the puffy fish uh, over on the side there. And um, so... Those are combined with um, an, an orchid, which we're looking down on. But yes. these things are all arranged and lit in a very particular way. But then, um, just like with my other process, I'm then deviating a little bit here and there. And you were mentioning sort of the um, painting in the background, which is more wet on wet. Um, I don't think I see any blooms in that. Yeah, that's where I'm. It's good to know the the, the language. So just wet on wet creates this effect where there's areas that cluster together and the there's more pigment, so there's a little bit more intensity there. Well, it's more like you're you're painting into a wet surface with a wet brush, right? right? So right. rather than a wet brush on a dry surface, which is going to give you a different effect and kind of a harder edge. So the edges of those uh, shadows are you know, dry edges and in the shadow it's wet. And so you get this kind of bleeding of the color, yeah, um, which is a little more atmospheric, which so your your notion of kind of looking down and maybe into an ocean like space or a watery space or an atmospheric space is, is intentional. Yes. Yeah, it definitely comes across. And so if you're looking down at this um, flower, right? So are you using a combination of the real thing and then photographing as well because or do you set this on the floor I set it on the floor and I light it that way but I also take pictures because as you probably rightly guess things will change if it's a it's a live plant and so and also the lighting will change and so I do document it so I have the photo reference and I have the actual reference and this is one where again it's a little more traditional in that I'm looking at actual objects and 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 lighting that is in my space as opposed to something that I'm photographically manipulating. So um, I really go back and forth between these different processes. 
And what's the what's the value that you see? Because like right, we live in a culture right now where there's so much digital and performance, and and um, what's the value in traditional still life as a genre? Like, why should art teachers focus on that? For example, that's a good question. I I think. Um... For me, part of the value of that is that you will see something in life, you know, in a 3D space differently than you will on a screen or in a flat, you know, projection or photograph. Um, No matter what you do, right, you're still going to see things differently. Like, you know, cameras will tend to flatten things out a little bit and, um, or change kind of the surface or, you know, change the focus. And of course, a camera will pick up a lot more information than you will, your eyes will, because we tend to focus on smaller parts of things at a time. Um, That's how our brains work, right? We can't take it all in the way a digital camera would, you know, so when you, when you take pictures, and I think this is a danger, like, again, people, students often working from a photograph, and they have all this detail in the photograph. And I try to remind them, you know, well, Really, you know, if you're in that space, you're not going to take all of that in with equal detail and and focus, right? That you're right. making, you're trying to make selections within that composition that, um, you know, are important to you visually, formally, conceptually. And so, I think when you're looking at something in real life, that that tends to happen more because that's how we work. That's how our eyes and brain yeah. work, right? And so, if we were too reliant on these photo images all the time, you maybe lose lose that a little bit. Um, so yeah, for having students work from still life trains them in a different way. It trains them to see a different way. And that's really, you know, when you're trying to own a skill like observational drawing or painting, being able to see is a critical yeah. part of that. Well, and back to your making choices, if I'm looking at something, uh, I can just shift my perspective just millimeters and see this new color that emerges in a shadow and then I could make the choice to oh, I'm going to put that in there uh, even though it's not exactly the view I'm strictly painting um, whereas a photo might capture that one thing and it's sort of frozen in time um, so it gives you the richness and I think that's similar um, as opposed to like when you mix your colors in a palette and then add them to the canvas uh, to the paper as opposed to maybe sometimes mixing them on the paper right like right. when you get this brilliance that comes through as they as they literally mix on the surface as opposed to being pre-mixed. Exactly. I think that's a brilliance that comes through that you don't always see um, in the drawing and the painting. And so I just blew up a detail and turned it sideways. I hope that's not uh, disregarding your painting at all. But I just loved the fact that you had these little critters emerging and uh, it just felt it they they don't look like toys like they look like the the real things except there's a playfulness about them so in that sense the toy aspect comes through but i just thought this was really a beautiful arrangement and i would have turned it the other direction but um it doesn't fit the slideshow but um right like this octopus type shape and you have the sharks and the blowfish and the, some sort of is it a crab um yeah it's a crab yeah, and I mean, the title relates a little bit to how some of these, um, like those two, I think they're sharks, uh, they're kind of paired together. And so there's like this, there's both um, this kind of pairing and togetherness and also div- dividing of these these figures. Right? Yeah, yeah. So, um, and there's, uh, you know, some of my work are, also has kind of a memorial quality to it and I feel like this it has a little bit of that it, it's definitely playful it's I think I think the toys are fun and they have their own kind of personality which um and and these particular um fish are pretty realistic which I think you're responding yeah, to yeah um but it's also you know when you put a, a kind of a floral element right in the middle that you have a lot of a lot of us have a lot of associations that might you know you might think of a memorial of some kind, of a remembrance of some kind. So I'm kind of making those associations too. Mm, nice. This is the last painting we'll look at today. Um, so the shrine? Is that shrine, what you, yeah. Shrine. Mm-hmm. And um, so how is this a shrine and how is this a still life? Uh, I've got a bird, it looks like a bird bath in the middle of a floral. So, um, right, we're looking at, and we're back to these intense colors. Now, are you using some of these uh, inks? 
These actually, no, aren't, I'm not using how you, inks. How do you um, get it this bright? So I, I like um, uh, Daniel Smith watercolors, my favorite pigment. They're two pigments. And they have lines of pigments that are really super intense. Um, I, so I, I really, you know, I choose my pigments for those reasons. Yeah. They're also um, another um, type of pigment. They're liquid watercolors. Um, Dr. P.H. Martin uh, liquid watercolors, super intense. Also, the paper I was mentioning before, this is cold press arches, bright white um, yeah. paper. So it tends to allow the pigment to sit more on the surface. Um, it's that absorption that makes it then less dynamic. Uh, maybe that's not the right way to phrase it, but um, yeah, it could be less the color. Brilliant, maybe. It could be the color of the paper. It could be like the, the surface of the paper. Mm. Um, so it's a combination of those things. That the pigment is, is the pigment load in the the paints that I use is pretty high, and the types of pigments I you know are pretty intense and saturated. Um, and I I like that in in my work. Not everybody does, but that's definitely something I'm drawn to. Um, this is actually a combination of images. So this is going back to, you know, using something like Photoshop. Yeah. But the imagery comes from, I'm trying to remember the place that it was, but it was a butterfly. So sometimes uh, natural science museums, again, this is a trip I took with my family. Um, I want to say it was maybe in North Carolina, but there was a, a science or um, a natural science museum that on the top they had a butterfly um garden or environment and there are several places that have have those types of spaces where it's like a greenhouse and they you know breed butterflies and so yeah. you go in and you can see them and so that's not a bird bath at the very top um it's a uh, butterfly feeding station there you go nice and so ah now that's watermelon in there yes so ah, they're eating there we go. they're eating the fruit and it's this kind of, again this is kind of like this offering um in uh, what i was thinking about here and so the other imagery as you can see is sort of underwater imagery so and there's a fish yes like i didn't see that until i was working with in these fact, slides for a while i'm like oh my gosh there are two actually and right. those are set up in kind of a symmetrical um Way sort of a, a yin and yang, a little call bit, and yeah. response, yeah. right, right, in a in a kind of framing, uh, you know, thinking back to maybe some religious art, um, and so this kind of notion of a shrine, or if you've seen shrines, especially in Europe, these very decorative kind of larger, you know, um, enclosures that have a window in the front, and you have the, they have these kind of vertical structures inside. Um, so something you're you're you value or you're remembering and that's precious to you um and that's kind of the the idea behind this piece and the, there's also this reliance between air and water so you know the butterflies would be the above ground air based you know environment and how that's so reliant on the ocean um water based environment and that's why these two things are combined in, in this imagery this is lovely and then so how do you yeah, I don't, we don't have time to talk about all this, but like, how do you even start a painting like this? Are you working from the background forward or how? It's a really good question because this piece was hard for me and I I, um, I struggled with it initially and I left it for a while because I was frustrated with how it was going. And then, yeah. Um, but yeah, this, this one did start with a lot of sort of wet on wet washes and, and sort of um, pigments bleeding that weren't you know, in specific kind of drawn elements as a, as a base, as yeah. the underpainting. And then I built elements on top of that. Um, and there are just lots and lots of layers and transparencies and overlapping images. So where I was, I was relying in part on imagery, photo imagery. A lot of this was in the painting itself. Yeah, yeah. So... I just know a lot of students who are new to painting and art making, they think of like, oh, I'm just going to start at the top and work my way down the page. And in watercolor, it's not like that, right? Like you're often working in your background areas and then working yeah. as you move forward in the, in the, maybe the subject matter, right? Right. Yeah. I mean, you have to, if you're working more traditionally with watercolor and you're trying to preserve your lighter values, mm -hmm. you have to be conscious of that as you're going and be thinking about where you want those so you don't accidentally eliminate that as an option. Um, but I feel like in all the painting that I do, I work over a larger surface, a larger area first, and I kind of 
lay in like kind of lighter colors or washes or stains if it's an acrylic painting. And then I build on top of that. And this is done in a very similar way. Yeah. So a lot of those kind of lighter blues that you see on the side, that was probably the underpainting for most of this. Yeah. And I know there's a the controversy in watercolor. Right? Do, you, do you use white paint or not? Sometimes I do. I, and, yeah. and so like, um, you know, uh, we I teach multiple approaches to watercolor in, in, in the fall. I don't let anybody use white paint. And then in the winter, I let them use whatever they want. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I don't I don't have like a philosophical opposition to it. I think um, when people uh, object to it, it's it's using kind of a pa it's because it creates a kind of pasty or opaque surface, which could be interesting or useful for what you're doing. If you want to have more of a light filled quality, leaving letting the paper kind of come through come through and allowing the light to kind of hit the paper and then shine back through the pigments that you're using, it kind of gives it a backlit or a, mm. a you know a, a glowing quality that you wouldn't get with a more opaque paint. So that would be a reason not to use it. So I don't use a lot of white. Occasionally yeah. I use it, and if I do use it, I use a really high quality like optic white or what the um, BH Martin um, uh, uh, liquid watercolor of white, which they're really, really strong. And they also move like the other pigments on the surface. So they're not as, they don't look as pasty or out of place. Yeah. 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 So for those of you that aren't painters, yeah, there's sometimes um, people, purists will say, well, you know, you're not a true watercolorist if you use white in your painting. And it's like, Really? Like, <laughs> no. <laughs> I mean, and I think the products you're describing, though, and the way you're describing it makes sense, right? So there is something to be lost if you add white, if it's a particular, if it's going to be this pasty, almost like a, it would be like putting gesso over top of your beautiful watercolor, right? And, and if you've got a paint that flows like you're talking about, this optic white that um, makes it more natural, then why not? Why not? If it's giving you the effect that you want, right? If that's a real, why not? That's the key. If it's giving the effect that, that you want, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Oh my gosh! I, you know, th this time goes really fast. I can't believe we've been talking for uh, about an hour now. So um, it's really wonderful to hear more about your process. Is there anything about your process you were hoping that I would ask you about that we didn't get to talk about? Um, I guess the only thing I would say is that I'm very, very slow when I'm, pay when I'm working with watercolor and it's, you have, kind of have to be patient. You have to be, um, and I wish I had more time as well. That's like an yeah. issue for me, but it is, a, it can be a very slow. Because you're a parent, right? You I'm have a, a life. And, I have yeah. a lot of other things going on, but it's also just the process itself is, is kind of, it's time intensive. And I think, you know, you have to make that choice if that's what you want to do. Yeah. Do you work on more than one painting at once? I do, yeah, usually. Um, it, it kind of depends. Like I usually have multiple things going, and then I'll focus more on one if it's one of the watercolors. But I flip back and forth between watercolor and acrylic, which is a faster process for me. And so I kind of bounce between those two things when I can. Yeah, yeah, that's that's wonderful. Yeah, so in a few minutes I'm going to um, ask you, right, I'd like to end this conversation by asking you to leave our listeners, uh, especially teens, with five tips or advice that might help them in expressing themselves through the visual art. So think about that for a minute. And um, I just need to thank a few people while we're, we're doing that. Um, yeah, I just want to make sure everyone realizes this series is made possible by an EMU College of Arts and Sciences Dean's Faculty Development Award, uh, which was made possible through a generous gift from the Game Above group. And this is a group of dedicated Eastern Michigan University alumni with various academic and professional backgrounds. Uh, special thanks to Max at Be Now Media for actually putting this uh, together and doing the editing and capturing our conversation. I really appreciate it, Max. And thanks to Grove Studios and Ypsilanti for giving us such a professional space to be able to record um, these sessions. And uh, super um, thanks to my guest uh, artists over the, the episodes and uh, particularly today, uh, uh, Maria, I really appreciate uh, you having the time to talk. So I'm going to give you the last segment here. Um, five tips, five things that you would leave people with uh, who really are interested in engaging processes of themselves. Yeah, I took some time to think about this. Um, one, the first thing, it's sort of like an order, almost building um, in, and, you know, it's like a foundation and then moving forward. Uh, I feel like it's important to take the time to develop the skills that you want to use. So, so skills, techniques, and processes, and the facility with materials that you're interested in, right? I mean, it takes time. I guess 
a lot of this comes from my background, having a professional musician as a father and also having taken a lot of music lessons myself. There's this notion that, um, you know, you need to practice basic things. You need to practice scales in order to be able to do other interesting things. And I feel like visual art isn't different from that. Like there is yeah. a skill set there that needs honing that you need to focus on without the pressure necessarily of making an artwork, that there are things that you do when you can to build those skills, to do what you want to be able to do to, you know, to have that facility. So, um, great advice. I yeah. feel like that sometimes get lost and, and, and people get frustrated if something doesn't work out right away. And I feel like, well, there's something about practicing and I teach that way too. You know, so when I'm teaching watercolor, I have people do a lot of practicing so that there's no other pressure other than to try this thing over and over again. We're not making a painting yeah. We might save it and use it for something else or cut it up later, but it's like, yeah. it doesn't matter. It should fail. It will fail. And you have to kind of get through that. And then it becomes a more intuitive process, which then allows you to do a lot more with what you're trying to do. So that's one thing I thought of. Yeah. Um, and then this is a little bit related and it comes from my own experience as a student, but if you can make a lot of something. Um, so I had a professor who was a super nurturing guy in in my when I was an undergraduate name was Irv Taran is Irv Taran and he at one point he told me he's like cut up this um you know this board all these boards uh wood boards so they have a hundred twelve by twelve um square pieces and just <laughs> just paint on them you know and he's he told me he's like you know a 10 percent keeper rate is pretty good right like you can fail 90% of the time, but if you get 10 good ones out of this process, that's not bad. And I'd never thought of it that way because I think often we're sort of focused on making each and every piece that we make work. And of course, this is more a luxury for students, people of more time, um, but it is a time to try that, like to just make a lot of something and allow, you know, and, and make it less precious for yourself yeah. and be willing to take some risks um, because you just are doing that number of things when they sell watercolor paper where you can buy them like a hundred sheet a hundred like four by four squares and so you could just like mess around on these four by four squares Absolutely. Just yeah don't worry about what it's going to be just try different techniques right yeah or give yourself a goal of like painting one a day or you know there's a there are daily painter websites and things like that and some of them are good some of them not but i mean just this notion of doing making yourself complete one um, a small piece, you know, on a yeah. regular basis is really healthy. Um, uh, and it, it's sort of the flip side of that is, um, you know, be willing to let something go, uh, you know, to start something and then realize that you really shouldn't follow up, <laughs> you know, like to, to not feel so invested. <laughs> I guess it's not really the flip side. It's part of that process where yeah. you're like, I'm doing a hundred of these, you know, if this one doesn't work out, I'm just going to put it aside and paint over it, just over it or do something different with yeah. it, you know? Um, but yeah, like, um, be willing to let it go. If it's, if, even if you've invested a certain amount of time, and that's hard for me, you know, if I'm working on a larger piece, um, now, especially it's so time intensive Yes, that if you've invested so many hours and, but you're looking, you're like, I just am not, it, I'm not engaging with this piece the way I should. It doesn't, it doesn't mean, you know, it's yeah. not important to me. I'm not interested in it anymore. Then I need to really let it go, even though I've put so much time in. Yeah. Um, uh, and I guess more the flip side of that would be like my fourth um, suggestion is like sometimes then um, lean into something. So if it's not working well, mm. do something maybe that you're not normally comfortable doing or it's outside of your usual practice or, you know, look at it in a different way. And, and if you already don't feel that great about it, then really ruin it or, or turn it into something good because you're problem solving. And I feel like sometimes I get to my best work that way where I've run into a problem with a piece or something. It's not working. It's not engaging in some way, but I lean into it. I, I keep working at it and I try things that I maybe wouldn't have Otherwise, and sometimes that works out, sometimes it doesn't. But when it does work out, sometimes that's a really strong piece. Well, it helps you be a risk taker. And then where do you know where your boundaries are if you don't take those risks? And yeah. then I think once you what you describe, once you've made the commitment, like, ah, I already feel like it's ruined. 
let's just really push it. Exactly. Uh, well, who knows? Maybe, yeah, you've discovered something that you never knew that you could get out of what you were doing. So that's yeah. great advice. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and it, sometimes it's really hard to do. But again, if it's like, well, I feel kind of blah about this piece. So let's see they really push it one way or the other. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> It'd be yeah. It's really awful. <laughs> and then, you know, I learned something along the way. Or maybe my process will result in something that I really do care about. Yeah. yeah. And number five. Um, so I guess this is more kind of an, uh, the, uh, the other end from where I was starting, which is like develop your skills. And this is more like in, investigate the things that really Im are important to you that you connect with personally, um, you know, that you can engage with that, that will hold your interests but are meaningful to you, even if you feel like, well, I don't know if there's a broader audience for this or yeah. application for it or it's not saying something big and meaningful because I think you can get to that place if you start closer to to where you are in your immediate experiences um and um you know that's not to say I you, maybe really what you are really engaged in is making formal work and I started there that's really where I'm coming from like what my, do you mean formal work so work that is really about um color and design and even I'm using even though I'm using representational imagery that the imagery itself wasn't as meaningful as the way it worked visually that's where I was coming from I was relating a lot of what I was doing to music yeah because of my background and then gradually came to a place where I'm um, embedding more um, meaning in the objects and elements that I'm using um in in my work so I feel like it's perfectly legitimate to be focused again, on those formal elements, um, but really knowing what it is that you, engages you and kind of in, investing yeah. in that. Yeah, because if you're making the work for someone else, like you're right. not going to be driven to do the work either. Exactly, right? exactly. You need to feel passionate. And uh, I do sense that if I'm doing something that really is deeply meaningful to me, it might resonate with other people, right? Because we're not so yeah. different as human beings. Right, exactly. Even though we tend to think we are, but... Oh my gosh, this has been so informative. And I um, thank you for all that great advice. Uh, it's been lovely having you on the show. Um, uh, yeah, so thanks. Uh, we've been, I've been talking to Maria Ruggiero and um, this has been wonderful. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. For, yeah, yeah. For I'd like to, me. yeah, my pleasure. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone for listening and uh, may you also go out into the world and engage artistic processes for yourselves. I'm Dr. Cam McComb and this has been Engaging Process. I've been talking to Maria Ruggiero and um, she's a painter, but uh, she's also an environmentalist. So it's been great having you and learning more about what you're creating in your work. So thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you.